Hello and welcome to episode one million and three. I say that because I still still have no idea what number we're on. Do you, Phil? Do you understand where we are in terms of numbers? No, 20 no something? idea. I drift in and out with episodes, so uh, yeah, I drift. No, there's usually really like <laughs> two episodes with me, two episodes with two other people, then back with me. Yeah. So uh, I, I get a little bit lost in total numbers, but <laughs> I you surely you're approaching fifty by now. Uh, well, uh, it's maybe the grey beard that makes you think that, but I'm I'm a lot a lot younger me. <laughs> <laughs> not, actually, not much younger, but <laughs> yeah, I think we're probably pushing on towards that, uh, if I'm honest. But what number it is, I don't know. This is the longest intro ever, uh, but um, we're at number something. Uh, we're back with Phil. Hello, Phil. Hello. And we're uh, we're we're kind of ready to crack on. So what I'll do is the usual housekeeping stuff that uh, Fergus, who's missing today, he's. Uh, either in the air or, or, or bouncing through LA on his way to Brisbane, jet setting all over the place at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, isn't here today, clearly. Um, so I'll, I'll absolutely botch his usual um, perfect rendition of what to do, which is subscribe, like, share, tell everybody, uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, that's as, about as much uh, as I can do that game, but um, make sure and do all the housekeeping stuff that keeps us happy. And, um, Hopefully you can enjoy the show. Um, we've been chatting beforehand and what we thought we'd do today was was kind of kick off by by really kind of going through, uh, I guess an overarching topic is, is exercise selection, but something we get asked now and again because of the way that we set up our programming is um, do hybrid athletes need to squat, bench and deadlift? So I guess the question is do hybrid athletes have a need to use powerlifting uh, staples as their uh, as as their main lifts, or use them at all, and I think from there we can probably uh, we can probably blend that into a little bit of exercise selection conversation and uh, see where that takes us. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, it sounds good to me. So, I guess we rather than a yes or no question, uh, what? Well, I'll fire it at you. What do you think? Do they need to squat, bench, and dead? Do we need to squat bench and dead? Well, I, I hate to start off with the standard it depends type of <laughs> response because I honestly hate those types of responses because clearly everything kind of depends. Um, but ultimately, I'd say yes, if the strength component of your hybrid training goals is to be better at these particular movements because yeah. you know the more you practice at them, the more you're going to get better at the skill of doing the movement. Uh, if your strength is something else or your strength goal was something else, I would say you don't necessarily need to, but some kind of derivative of those exercises will certainly be a core staple of your strength training because, you know, they are, you know, people call them the compound lifts, but ultimately they're lifts where you can really start adding load to the body and um, because we might need to do that to you know, really develop the kind of stress that we want to adapt to, you know, it makes it a good option. So uh, yes, and then yes, but with a bit of a twist. <laughs> yes, and then maybe yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the knee jerk re reaction for me, although I, I fully agree with what you're saying, in fact, and, and so it'll sound like I'm not, but I am, uh, is no, no, we don't have to, uh, unless which I suppose is the same way as starting the conversation or starting the answer with depends, isn't it? Yeah, that um, your way sounds much better. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we, 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 we tend to look at those as being, or, or, or people tend to look at those as being the three lifts that are absolutely necessary to get strong, and that's simply not the case. It's, uh, you, you highlighted it really well, I think, in, in that you're saying, well, ultimately you were saying it depends on the outcome, doesn't it? If, uh, mm. if part of your hybrid journey is to express strength through powerlifting uh, uh, staples such as the you know SBD um, then yes ultimately you're going to have to do those lifts in order to get better because you're going to have to develop the skill as you said if um, you simply want to become stronger whilst attending to something that sits kind of maybe in that endurance spectrum then there's really no need to mm. to look at compound lifts as being the only way you know there, there are so many ways to skin that particular cat that uh, unless you are directly saying, I want to get better at squat, uh, it's unlikely that you or I or any coach really is going to say, well, if you want to develop leg strength, there is no other route to that than squatting or deadlifting. And I suppose, 
yeah, coming back to you, this is where I said I'd circle back and I have done. It depends. It depends mm. basically on, on what your goals are. Um, and I suppose it depends. Uh, we should call this episode, It Depends. Uh, I suppose it depends on, on um, the experience of the athlete as well. We certainly don't want people to think that if they were to come to us, for instance, or if they wanted to start their hybrid journey, that that means that they would have to stop using the leg press and start using the squat, you know, as, as their means of, of developing leg strength or, or maybe, you know, perhaps wrongly, perhaps rightly, maybe people are concerned about form during something like a deadlift. And then they think, oh, well, if I want to be hybrid, hybrid, that's the only way I'm going to do it. And we'd want to kind of say, listen, let's let's find out a little bit about you first, wouldn't we? Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you had a novice ap- athlete, you know, that really is kind of a clean slate. So if we're thinking it from a skills perspective, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, why not? Like, you know, there are three options where you can build load and, you know, if they're new to it, why not choose those to then start that skill development journey? But you could also do that with any particular exercise. Uh, even if you chose, you know, barbell reverse lunges or, like a single leg deadlift with the uh, rear foot is kind of supported by a wall. Um, you know, there are so many options where potentially if you worked on that skill for a longer period of time, you could really kind of load it. Mm. So if, I mean, my ten, my approach would, if they're new, I would probably use all of those because I want to sort of build a sort of general base of skill learning. Um, but as they start to get stronger, um, I wouldn't necessarily always go for the, SPD um, because of you know there are just so many other options that you can potentially use and we could argue single leg versus uh, you know bilateral movements and all of those types of things Um, but ultimately if you just give your client enough time for skill development and just work at it over and over again they're gonna get gonna get better and by getting better you're gonna be able to expose them to a lot of load in the end so yeah yeah agreed um I guess there's another uh, another question that, that sits in amongst that, uh, or another concern that sits amongst that, is that maybe slightly outside, or actually, no, I, I correct myself, let me just say it, the, um, the idea of whether a person enjoys those lifts or not is, is, is going to be paramount. If we, mm. if we are to tell somebody, we think that you should squat because that's going to do X, Y, Z, and ABC over and above, whatever, um, and they just bloody hate squatting, no, no matter whether or not, you know, and we're, and we're assuming this individual doesn't have any contraindications, there's nothing, you know, injurious going on, they haven't had a, a history of that, and uh, they simply don't like those lifts. Uh, that's that's something that's key to consider, isn't it? Because in my experience as a coach, um, and it doesn't really matter what the lift is, we're just using squat as proxy for a lift that, that people don't like, but uh, if you ask somebody to do an exercise that you, as the coach, thinks... Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> you. You, as the coach, thinks um, is of of value in terms of uh, uh, program uh, progression and, and the development of said strength, and that individual doesn't like it. You, no matter how much you might want to convince them, or no matter how much you you might have uh, plenty data sets that say, "Well, this works." If they don't like it, they're not going to do that, and. Uh, that can be hugely detrimental, more so than saying, well, regress this way or choose, let, let's st- step three feet to the left and use a, use a machine. Mm. I almost find myself using athlete preference as one of the main driving forces for exercise, exercise selection. Yeah. If you've got so many exercises which you can load up, you know, you know, just pick one that you know the athlete is going to like and be consistent with and like over time. And usually it is you know the the basic squat bench deadlift because um i guess sometimes they're easier skills to pick up in comparison to something like a a single leg deadlift uh you might see bigger progression more weight on the bar and we can argue whether that's a a a good thing or not but it's certainly going to improve an athlete's self-esteem over time so you know i'm I'm developing here i can see it literally what's in front of me on this on this bar i like this so yeah you almost want to okay what's your preference what do you like what do you, you like? know use yeah. that as one of the main factors of deciding what exercise you're going to to use because if we want people to be consistent so they can develop the skill over time 
you know we want to make sure that their enjoyment of that uh movement is there throughout otherwise they're just not going to do it no i think that's that's uh absolutely vital to understand isn't it uh mistakes i've made as a coach in the past in fact i can speak from from previous eras is, is that kind of idea uh putting together a program thinking well, these are the most quote unquote a word i've come to hate uh, certainly quote unquote optimal exercises for for growth and uh, as you said at the top end of this the you know we may have the greatest opportunity for load during this particular movement therefore that's the movement we should pick because we can then you know load linearly for a longer period of time and mm. you know you look at it in black and white and look at it from from that perspective and think well now that i've written this program based on these factors that i've decided it is a functionally useful program and then you put it in front of the athlete and there's those three lifts that we're discussing and they think each one of those makes me feel sick at the thought of it you know <laughs> it doesn't matter mm. how, how impressed you are with your program rating the if the athlete doesn't like it and isn't isn't likely to attend to it, or even if they do for a certain period of time because they fully trust in you it's it's going to wane and therefore progression is going to wane and what have we gained what we've lost probably however much time we manage to force that person's uh, uh, will against them to, to do those exercises and, mm. and ultimately the coaching the coaching relationship is uh, degrading in amongst it so yeah uh, it's a it's a vital consideration but one i, I think uh, and from your own coaching experience um I, I think you'd agree one that's easily overlooked uh, and, until you kind of switch that uh, uh paradigm a little and realize that the driver for success is not the programming it's actually the athlete isn't it yeah definitely uh well you you think of the term or the phrase many roads lead to Rome, mm -hmm. but people are so confident that the road that they choose is the right way. Uh, and when there's so many roads, there's nothing really wrong in understanding that. And then just having many roads, which you could set your athlete down because, yeah. you know, as long as you pick one and head down it, it's probably going to be a good thing. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of sort of, a lot of confidence in some coaches into in their program as in you know this is the way to do it uh and everyone has their methods and i think that's that's great but you just yeah. always have a bit of an understanding as especially with novice athletes that they could be on someone's other program who's aiming for the same goal but looks completely different and probably still have the same results it's so when you reach the like higher echelons where we got to start making uh very very specific decisions yeah. and that could be the the make or break but um you know certainly in the early days enjoyment is such a big thing and there's probably several different types of program that they're going to enjoy i think the problem people often find is because they enjoy so many they try and do too much at once or they keep chopping and changing their program and it's the fact that the individually those programs aren't a problem it's just because, you know, they do something for three weeks and then they've read something else online. Oh, I want to do that. And they change program again and there's no consistency. Mm -hmm. So even though those individually, those programs, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just the fact they keep dropping and changing between them, which is disrupting their development. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we, we tend to want people to to stick with a consistent methodology or a consistent approach and, and probably a, a consistent exercise selection uh, uh, for I'd say 12 to 16 weeks minimum before you're able to say okay you know we, we can talk about whether or not this is actually working from an adaptive perspective I think possibly earlier on than that you would get the answer to the question is the athlete enjoying this program mm -hmm. um, but um, there could be as you say in amongst that there's this kind of tendency to want to kind of tinker with it and play with it just for the sake of playing with it. I think, do you know who's worse at that, Phil, is coaches themselves, isn't it? Is mm. A coach might look to, in two reasons. If, even if you're coaching another coach, that, that coach tends to want to tinker with their own programming. And or if you if you attempt to coach yourself, it's easy to find that two, three weeks down the line, it's nothing like it was when you first wrote it and you can't quite understand why. Uh, but yeah, I would say definitely, uh, uh, you know, 16 weeks is a, is a good kind of window, uh, which seems like a long time. But again, if you... If you look at the adaptive process, which you could probably describe better than me, um, you're not really getting much uh, uh, in terms of adaption and progression happening, without, you know, in any shorter period of time anyway. So it's kind of impossible to know if something's worked unless you can stay consistently with it. I mean, 
yeah, genuine long-term adaptations that you can really build on, uh, I think, you know, do take that time, especially when it comes to skill development. Like you, you said, 12 to 16 weeks, I, I think, to be very good at particular skills takes much, much longer, yeah, like yeah. years. Um, and strength is kind of the same. Um, it does take a while. And the reason people don't get as strong as they could be is because they keep chopping and changing. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, you know, they're not practicing yeah. strength ultimately. Yeah. No, like, like you could say someone's trained in strength for 10 years and they haven't really made huge changes into how they do it, but they're just consistent with it over the time. And just that progressive overload because they're just used to doing the same thing over and over again. The body's sort of just been forced to adapt. Um, so, you know, doing nothing crazy over 10 years, they just get ridiculously strong because they've allowed themselves to develop over that particular time. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Certain things take longer than others to um, see certain adaptations, but like genuine that you can really build on, I do think takes a considerable more about amount of time. Yeah. Uh, but those initial adaptations that you get sometimes you know you can see some really big improvements but it kind of depends what your starting point is and it's because you see those big improvements which leads people to push too much too soon yeah yeah agreed uh, and that's another reason why people keep chopping changing programs an interesting uh, question or an interesting part of this question i think uh, from a, again from a coaching perspective and maybe from direct experience is that uh, and, and often uh, and I hope this is taken in, in the right uh, uh, sense, uh, more so from women in my experience, is that the the SBD, squat, bench and dead, because the barbell is involved, tends to be something that um, people might shy away from because of a, a fear of doing those lifts. So there might be a, well, I, I, don't, I don't really want to do squats and deadlifts because those, you know, those seem like things that are a little bit outside of my comfort zone. Um, you see more men gravitating towards the free weights much less so now that i think and it's great to see but you see more men gravitating towards those kind of free weight areas and, and fl throwing barbells about than you do women and and from the coaching experience i've got it tends to be because there's a lack of confidence there and so sometimes that question um do we need to do squat bench and dead isn't because the question is framed around what is better for my growth it's it's more about um Oh God, do I have to do that thing that I fear? Uh, mm. And I always found that to be an interesting thing is that once people, and, and it comes back to, to this kind of overarching understanding of the skill development and practice, as, as you're saying, is that uh, once we can get past that, break that kind of seal of it, it being something that's uh, specifically for a certain kind of person and remove that idea that those particular lifts are only powerlifting strength sports lifts and actually say well these can be used in so many ways you know we, we don't have to be doing you know three rep max uh, german volume training <laughs> and you know chico this and that or, or all great training methodologies i should say but um really just getting into that position finding the the balance the the skill in it uh, and the fun in it uh, is <laughs> once you've gotten over that particular hurdle then those lifts might be very different to the lifts that you thought they were in the first place, which is mm. always fun to watch. I have um, a question for your experience. So if someone has, uh, you know, anxiety over performing some of those lifts, um, do you use a strategy of, okay, let's try all these different derivatives to hopefully circle your way back to the squat? So derivatives to get them sort of like more confident leading to the squat, or do you try and convince them that, look, if we just take this slow and take these steps, you know, this squat anxiety example, uh, for example, will slowly dissipate because it kind of like ties into this question of do hybrid athletes need to squat bench and deadlift? It's like, well, if they do, and they're nervous about it at the start, do we, you know, really try and not push, but we make changes to lead them down that path so they end up squat bench and deadlifting going forward uh the, the short answer to that is th th that very last part of the question do we do that um i, I guess i have to make sure that we don't uh, or i don't sound aggressive and yes we push them towards it because that's what <laughs> we want but uh, I, I would uh, but not because of the I, I like that question because it's not 
it's not because I then um, have, uh, uh, it's not because I would then have the opportunity to say, great, we can have now got them doing squat, bench and dead. Because uh, as we said a few times, th there are more, one ways to, more than one way to skin a cat. So um, we don't have to do those lifts, again, unless that person wanted to power lift. But then that particular person you're talking about actually has said that they want nothing less. So, so uh, uh, I think where I would come at that from is just that kind of fear factor is that why is that individual... Uh, set against those particular lifts and usually through conversation uh, and usually through experience it's one of two things uh, that they'd be uh, afraid of uh, injury um, because of, maybe because of biases that they've got from hearing about people get you know the usual nonsense if you, you know barbell lifting uh, compresses your spine or, or whatever crap people might have been hearing uh, but there are there is mis misinformation that's easily absorbed out there so it might be that they might fear the lift because they fear injury um, and or uh, and this more so, I think I've come up against is they fear the lift because they fear it's actually a competence. They, f they don't want to look stupid um, because they can see other people lifting well. They can tell clearly that it's a skill they may have tried and, you know, felt like they look ridiculous, didn't know what they were doing. Somebody else in the in the gym was throwing 100 kilos around like it was an empty suit and they had the barbell on and were getting kind of crumbled by it. Um, that 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 particular those two particular things would lead me to think well it would be it would be very useful that for this athlete to then learn directly how to do those the lifts because then we can remove that fear altogether for them and and open up that opportunity for more now if we yeah. if we teach those lifts uh, and and I have used those lifts just to teach balance just to teach um a little bit of proprioception if you put a barbell on somebody's back and ask them to look forward and keep it over their uh, midfoot, um, they tend to squat better just with that one cue because they're actually thinking about balance, aren't they? I, I don't mm. know if that's something that makes sense over mm. over this medium, but um, once they have that kind of awareness of balance, which you can use a barbell for very well, you can then apply that to loads of other things like throws and jumps and all kinds of stuff because they know where their centre of gravity is in comparison to their, to their uh, midline or, you know, wh whatever that might be. So I think it becomes a useful tool then to take the athlete from a position of fear to a position of using that fear, which speaks into a lot of our, our conversations on, on, on these podcasts. But in that particular case, using that fear then to develop more skill and actually, you know, further down the line, they might say, you know, I, I tried it. I got relatively good at it. I didn't lift a huge amount of weight, but I definitely know how to squat. I still don't like it. So I choose these other kind of things. It's just not my favorite lift. Uh, but then we don't have that, oh, God, I don't want to do it because my back might break, or, oh, God, I don't want to do that because I don't want to look, you know. Uh, you know, the, the, mm. the gym thing with girls is, uh, again, much, much less so, but this is just from experience, I should reiterate, is that the people think that people are watching them. They think people are looking at them and thinking, look at that idiot. Ha, ah, they don't know what to do, and I, I'm the expert, you know. And <laughs> some people are doing that, well, fuck them but the the the, uh, the reality is that you're only a few a very few uh, uh good coaching sessions away from having that new option and removing that kind of fear uh, and some of that could be educational talking about them. why do you think you would get injured and we can we can remove some of those barriers just in over a coffee but uh mostly just getting somebody under the bar teaches them that they are strong it seems like such a strong thing it looks like a strong people, people associate a squat with being strong so if you're able to put a barbell on your back, hold it in the right position, develop the mobility to do that, maybe that was a deciding factor. Over time, we, 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 we find that individual's full range of motion. They squat up and down just with a barbell and you're able to film them and show them compared to what they did the first time. That's a huge mountain to climb and, and, and the confidence and the elation that somebody will come out of a session like that with is, is worth wasting time, if that's the right <laughs> way. It's worth, it's worth spending time, certainly on developing a skill that you and I could argue here isn't even necessary for the ultimate goal, but mm. I think it's necessary, a long winded response to a good question, but I think it's, it's very, very useful because then whether or not they get better at barbell lifting, they will get more confident overall in general about who they are and what they can achieve. So we've, you know, that's a bell rung in my opinion. Mm. What do you think? Does that make sense? No, it makes absolute sense and you know confidence self-esteem whatever it might be is such a an important part of an athlete's journey and probably one that we kind of forget especially when we've been doing something like squatting for so many years 
you know, for someone that's quite new to that type of thing, we completely forget the anxiety that it brings the, the even to even think about other people in the gym looking at us in the sense that, oh, that person doesn't know what they're doing. Like you just, as soon as you, you're used to it, you just kind of forget that those yeah. comments or thoughts could even exist. And yeah, I really do have the most admiration for someone who has the, that anxiety and then takes steps to try and remove that anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, weirdly, I, when you were talking about your, your answer, maybe really reflect on whenever you see someone go, Oh, look at this person, look at how much they've improved mm -hmm. in terms. And that might be just because how it looks or uh, in terms of confidence, but it's always, or very usually one of the powerlifting lifts or it's a weightlifting lift yeah, yeah it seems you know look at this person on instagram look at this you know they send on whatsapp it's always one of those main lifts you know you you, you never really see uh look at this person they've got really a lot better look at their confidence and they're you know curling in a using a cable and there's nothing <laughs> wrong with that but you yeah, know no. you don't really share those types of videos um so it shows the power of you know, improving up those lifts and, you know, yeah. as a method of socially improving your um, self-esteem, I'm guessing it can have the opposite effect if done poorly, but yeah. Um, well, and, and, and hopefully that's, that's where a good coach steps in and, and mm. understands that their role is not just to, just to, just to push for that uh, adaptation, just to push for that metrics driven progression, you know, okay, they have now squatted more today than they did yesterday. And that is a box ticked. Therefore I'm a good <laughs> coach. It's like, well, did they, did they come into the session um, happier, more confident or, or leave the session happier and more confident either way is the measure that it, this individual is now gaining skills, gaining confidence and seeing that, you know, that I've always thought, and maybe this is a, a a strange thing for a strength coach or a strength and conditioning coach to say. Um, but I've always thought that the, the strength work in the gym when you're coaching somebody directly is not really the, the, the outcome for the session. The, the, or the outcome is dictated, obviously, by the programming. We want to do this and this and this. And, you know, if it's a powerlifting program, that's kind of relatively straightforward in the sense that we have some SPD to do today and, and, and then some back off work and then maybe some, some accessories that speak to your particular athlete. But the outcome has always been for me, did the athlete come away uh, and it couldn't, it might not be a, ultimately a successful set. They might lift, miss their lifts that day and all the rest of it. And that's, that's a learning uh, opportunity for everybody. But um, did they come away from the session having achieved something? And that doesn't necessarily mean those lifts are, mm. are, the, are the marker for that, if that makes sense. Has, has that individual come away happier, more confident? So although the session is very, this is a little bit philosophical now, but mm. the session itself and the whole idea of coaching somebody is based around these particular uh, uh, um, exercises. Uh, the outcome should be bigger than that. You should be facilitating somebody's opportunity to grow as an individual. And that's not a physical thing. That should be a, a, a spiritual thing, <laughs> spiritual weightlifting, I would li I'd like to call it. But uh, yeah, I, I think that, that then, you know, a barbell on itself rather than something like a leg press and rather than something like a, a cable curl, as you say, represents something to people. It represents something more than just having exercised that day. It represents stepping into an arena that they didn't previously understand or, or um, you know, doing something physically that they previously thought they couldn't do. And um, so that could be just curling a ball into the top left corner or it could be, mm. you know, landing a trick on your skateboard or something. It, it could, could be anything but in that circumstance it's that particular thing in which case if you got closer to that 360 kickflip that day and it just happens to be a barbell full range of motion squat with with uh, with a nice form and you know a, a, a nice barbell path uh, it's the same thing it's the same outcome it's the same high five at the end of it look what you achieved and mm -hmm. the moment is the high five and the look what you achieved not the squat itself <clears throat> if that wasn't a ramble i don't know what was <laughs> do you uh squat bench and deadlift in your current program yes uh yes i'd think about that only because um probably more in the current programming than i'm doing than ever before have i uh, squatting is still right there in the middle for me because i'm, I'm developing leg strength uh it's, it's it's great for me for 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 developing balance it's great to because i've got that uh, injury uh, 
long-term injury in my left leg. It's great for me to make sure that you know I'm unilaterally strong despite other exercises being there. I know that if I'm squatting well, that I'm balancing well, etc. I'm under, under decent load. But I don't I don't bench at all, um, and I deadlift relatively rarely at the moment, but only because uh, the, the the specifics that I'm looking for from this current training cycle are more about um, the the specificity of the outcome. Um, and actually, actually speaking to, the, to to some of the stuff that we've been talking about today, there are a few things that speak against certain things. So, so I don't like to bench um, because I've got a torn shoulder from years ago from from BJJ, and, and I find that the the better I get at that. The, the worse my pain becomes. So it looks like I'm doing well and the numbers go up, but I'm I'm then holding my shoulder when I go to bed and stuff. So it's just, it doesn't help not me. Not worth it. It's not worth it. No, um, I am stronger, but I'm ultimately weaker, if that's not mm. a strange uh, paradox. And uh, deadlifting I love, um, but, uh, and that's probably the lift that I'm best at, but it takes a lot out of me overall. And it means that, you know, uh, do I need to get better at deadlift or can I use some of that overall energy uh, in order to uh, to look at other parts of my programming that, that could that could progress better without that noise of fatigue in the background that a deadlift a heavy heavy deadlift might give me um so they are there uh, but they're certainly not the mainstay i think squats probably the most uh, consistent and then i do a lot of um at the moment and always have done a lot of, a lot of lunging uh, and uh, a lot of unilateral work but a lot of different squat variations so we've concentrated a lot in this last Oh, 10 weeks, I would say, uh, on Zercher squats and the progression of Zercher squats um, because of the, the 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 pool, because of the nature of that lift dragging me forward. Front, front squats as well, Zerchers and front squats, I've gotten very strong at those because um, uh, of the, the, the load imbalance and the, the fact that that's going to pull me, my torso down and I'm, I'm uh, going to be carrying a big pack up and down hills. So mm. uh, again, another long answer, but it's not there as a mainstay in the program. I, I've nod to them i think they're good but there are other things that are better for me at the moment so i suppose that's quite a good way of encapsulating the, the overall question isn't it is that mm. people would look at what is what we're, we're what we're saying is hybrid uh training uh and, and in a certain degree we can argue that what i'm doing is relatively extreme uh, and i haven't necessarily had to lean into squat bench and deadlift uh, but i am doing things that that nod to them Does that make sense yeah well the first answer to the question at the beginning of the, this episode was it depends and you've just given a description of a it depends answer like yeah. this is kind of my goals these are how I've adapted things uh, this is why I think it's important this is why I think actually with these changes it's not as important but I'm still getting this kind of straining training stress so yeah I think it nicely sums up the uh, <laughs> the original answer yeah. with, a, with an example and, and the very last part of that, and I think we could probably close off at that point, but the very last part of that is because I, I said I really do like deadlifting. And, and Alex, has, as you probably know, Alex Viad has been uh, really managing my programming for me and monitoring that relatively closely. But I know if I were to say to Alex, do you know what I could do with? I'd really like to just pull a heavy deadlift. That's all. I'd really just like to do that. Now, it, it might not sit within the cycle of programming that we're attending to at the moment. It might not even look good within the micro cycle because it might shoot a few days in the in, in the foot for me um but alex is, is such a good coach uh, and and we have the same leanings he and i is that you would say okay clearly the reason johnny's asking can i do a deadlift is he wants that kind of all out full control this is something i know i can do well i want to just go balls to the wall and throw out throw out the kind of progressive pattern and it's basically like saying it's not dissimilar to saying I just want to have a blowout. I don't want to be on diet today. Can I just have a pizza mm. for God's sake? You know, you're like, mm. if you say to that person no, because that's going to ruin your whole diet. Chances are, at some point, they're going to fall off further than the pizza, aren't they? And I think the same thing applies to lifting. In actual fact, is that you know I can say I, I really just want to pull a horrible deadlift, or or it might be the opposite of that. I'm just I know it's not in the program today, but I'd love to go out for a five hour walk in the mountains, and that's all I want to do. Mm. Yeah, okay, so what we'll do is we'll toggle and adjust the rest of the week in order to let that fit in there because obviously psychologically that's going to be rewarding for you, but we don't want it to be physically detracting. So we, we play with it, we communicate, we talk. The athlete's needs, uh, which in that case are probably psychological, kind of usurp every other need, uh, drop it in two days later. 
you know, that really took a lot out of me, but I'm glad I did it because, you know, and it's, it's some, sometimes that's ego driven, you know, I can, mm. I want to know that I could still pull what I pulled the other, and if I pull more than I expected, then it, it sets me up for a great week. So not that I'm saying jump off program and do what you like. I'm saying talk to, talk to your coach and you might find that those things are, are really useful. But um, again, another, another ramble, but it, it, it does kind of add flavor to the fact that listening to your athlete uh, and listening to your coach and, and allowing for adjustment that may be, may be manifest in your program, but it's actually driven by its psychological needs is, is vital, I think. It, it, otherwise, the whole thing falls to bits, doesn't it? Yeah, certainly. I don't I don't see any problem with just having those odd days where, you know, just go for something that you really want to do. Um, because quite often the mental aspect of that is going to be really quite positive. Yeah. And then to mitigate any negative impacts of it could just require a few tweaks in the day or two afterwards. And it's no problem. If you do it all the time, yeah, then you've got an issue. But when it's just <laughs> that one one session like next time i want to see you full dominoes while deadlifting a pr <laughs> at the same time as in again no, single okay. yes yeah, single yeah <laughs> single arm deadlift pizza on the other hand yeah wash this it down with whiskey the, the usual whiskey yeah this seems like a challenge though phil uh well that's hybrid um, that's three things so uh but yeah yeah very <laughs> hybrid tribrid. <laughs> tribrid. <laughs> we've got we're onto something there yeah we have let's let's ditch on there we're going to set up we love hybrid marketing athletes. so uh <laughs> well on that note then mate uh i've enjoyed that i really have enjoyed that there's been there's been plenty to play with i think it, it would be easier to go back and listen to ourselves again to summarize but i'll try very briefly to say that it depends was the answer to the question about uh, exercise selection, really. It was framed around those uh, the SBD. Uh, it depends on athlete preference. It depends on the needs of the program. It depends on the skill that is required. It depends on the, um, on the environment psychologically and physically within which we're training. We might want to use those lifts not for lifting purposes, but for confidence building purposes. Uh, and it depends on the conversation that you're having. So... I do think it would be a good title for the for the show this week would be to say uh, the question was, but it doesn't matter because the answer was it depends. Mm. <laughs> we should do a future episode where we need to find the question where the answer isn't it depends. D well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few. Uh, uh, does does Johnny like a whiskey? Yes. <laughs> uh, would he have the dominoes with that whiskey? Yes. Has Phil challenged <laughs> him to also attempt a single leg, a single arm deadlift? Well, with yes. Yes, so we we could get, but then we'd be contriving the questions just so I get to do what I want. So maybe maybe we'll, maybe we'll not do that one. Um, it, it behooves us to say behooves is a good word. It behooves us to say that we uh, would like to encourage you to have a look if you have other questions or if you want to get involved in in, in discussions uh, uh, more in depth about the science of uh, of hybrid training or about programming or about other other elements that kind of surround that whole thing. Then we have the the premium service that you can find through all the usual channels, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, bio, and all that kind of stuff. Where um, uh, Phil is is populating the uh, the database with more and more uh, in depth uh, lectures about the, the the deep the deep physiology and more uh, in, involved in in this kind of game. And uh, and and Q and A's happen there as well. So if you've got your own questions that you want to fire to us, then we can we can do that on there. And all the usual stuff that I said at the beginning very badly. If you would like to continue to support us, then press all the buttons that do that. I'm sure you know which ones those are. And um, comment. Commenting seems to be seems to be something that helps us. So engagement. Comment. Engagement, yes. Engage with us. And, uh, and we'd <laughs> love that. And uh, we'll be back soon with another episode. I think probably you and I again uh, before, before Fergus gets back with another show. And uh, we look forward Sounds to seeing good. you all there. So thanks very much to, to see you. Thanks very much to see you. What a terrible end. Great to see you. Thanks very much, Phil. And we'll see you again. Cheers, mate. Cheers.